Live from WGAL, the race for U.S. Senate. Tonight, we hear from the candidates hoping to be the Democrat facing incumbent Republican Pat Toomey in November. Good evening and welcome. I'm Jerry Gish along with News 8's political analyst, Dr. Terry Madonna. Well, thank you, Jerry, and uh, welcome uh, candidates. And uh, Franklin Marshall College is delighted to be a partner in this debate this evening. Absolutely. We're looking forward to a great evening, and we welcome the Susquehanna Valley viewers and those watching across the state tonight as well. And tonight, we are with three candidates running for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. And first, let's introduce you to the candidates. John Fetterman grew up in York. He graduated from Albright College and has a master's degree from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He moved to Braddock, a suburb of Pittsburgh, and has been Braddock's mayor since 2005. John and his wife, Giselle, have three children. Katie McGinty grew up in Philadelphia. She went to St. Joseph's University and Columbia University. Under President Bill Clinton, she served as chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. In 2003, she became the head of the State Department of Environmental Protection. She ran for governor in 2014. Governor Tom Wolf then named her his chief of staff. She's married with three daughters and lives in Chester County. Joe Sestak was born in Delaware County. He attended the U.S. Naval Academy and earned a Ph.D. from Harvard University. He served in the Navy for 31 years. He also served in Congress from 2007 to 2010. He served as President Bill Clinton's director for defense policy and ran for Senate in 2010. Sestak is married with one daughter. So here's the format for tonight. We will go alphabetically asking each candidate a question. Then that candidate will get a minute and a half to answer. Then the other candidates will get one minute to respond if they choose. Then the candidates will make closing statements at the end of our broadcast tonight. So let's begin. And the first question is from Mr. Madonna. First question goes to Mr. Fetterman. There has been and there continues to be a big dispute in this country over trade agreements. Both President Obama and former President Bush supported and implemented uh, the so-called free trade agreements, and now in the news, of course, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. This debate takes <clears throat> the form of free trade versus fair trade. What is your position in this dispute, and how would you explain how trade should be handled, given the importance of the global marketplace? Sure. Well, uh, again, I'm uh, mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and uh, if anyone's familiar with Western Pennsylvania, they know Braddock, and Braddock lost 90% of its population. And during my time there, um, you know, there's been one incontrovertible fact that uh, free trade in this country has never been fair trade for communities like my own, like Braddock. Uh, and that's not just my community. Communities all over Western Pennsylvania, all over Pennsylvania, in fact. Um, uh, as I've said before, I never thought I'd live to see the day when I would say Ross Perot was right. And Ross Perot said that it was going to be a giant sucking sound when we enacted NAFTA. And that's exactly what happened in, in Western Pennsylvania and in communities all across uh, the country. Uh, for me, my key metric when we're talking about trade deals is, is that are we valuing and protecting blue collar manufacturing jobs in this country the same way we're valuing high tech uh, uh, jobs? And consistently across the board, we haven't been doing that. And unions have been getting the shaft uh, through these agreements. And at the end of the day, uh, free trade has never been fair trade. And, uh, and that's why I oppose the TPP. And, uh, and that's why I'd be very skeptical of any so-called free trade agreement. Thank you. Ms. McGinty. Thanks, Terry. Uh, you know, we have been, I feel, like throwing a Hail Mary pass for the past 30 years. Just one more trade agreement, and finally, we'll get some market share. We'll be able to grow our manufacturing economy. In fact, what we've seen is the opposite. With these trade agreements has come a loss of our manufacturing uh, prowess that we had, and with that has come a loss of the middle class in this country. I think we need to turn in a very different direction. You know, you talk about TPP, and even there, the proponents uh, will tell you that TPP will bring a loss of 50,000 good paying jobs a year. That's a loss we can't afford. You know, I've lived and worked overseas and I've seen what it is as U.S. companies try to set up business uh, in these other countries. Even when it's supposedly working, we're handing over 49 to 50 percent of the company and we lose our intellectual property, our technology. I think it's time to just invest in the American worker and build our markets. Mr. Sestak. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, NAFTA was wrong. 
the TPP is not right. And that's because eight of the 11 countries within it have minimum wages less than $3. But we are no longer in, let's say, as we were in the 60s and 70s Cold War, in an arms race, military. We are in economic arms race. And there's two reasons why we try, have to try to make them work. The first is that for every million billion dollars of exports, if we can knock down their trade tariffs, we gain 7,000 jobs. Our trade deficit, if we got it to zero, would be 300 jobs here. <clears throat> the second reason is we want to bind nations over there, particularly surrounding China, that are worried right now to us with our economic rules of the road, not China's that's established an infrastructure bank and has actually had Britain join it. That's why we have to get it to be fair trade, but understand it's also a national security issue, both in our economy to knock down their tariffs and also to bind them to us so they do not, as China did, shut off all rare earth minerals to Japan. Because 99% of all rare earth minerals, which is in everybody's cell phone, every single munition our military uses is controlled by them. We've got to knock that down. All right, Mr. Sestak, thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Ms. McGinty. During this campaign, you've touted the endorsements that you have received, including from President Obama. But during this campaign, it seems that many voters, both Democrat and Republican, are looking for political outsiders or people viewed as not part of the establishment. If you were to win in the fall, would you be an independent voice in the Senate? Well, I appreciate that question. And I also uh, fully understand and appreciate where voters are coming from. You know, they're angry and they know that neither the economy nor our political system and our government has been working for them. You know, why is it that we have a middle class that's now squeezed to near disappearance? Uh, it's because the system has been rigged against the average person. You know, why is it that we've seen wages actually erode and not keeping up with the cost of college and every other skyrocketing cost? Now, I do come into this race, and I'm proud to have uh, the endorsement of President Obama, but that's because he knows I'm a fighter. He endorsed me specifically because I rolled up my sleeves to go to bat for those families and specifically to make it so that we expanded Medicaid in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 500,000 people now covered with that insurance and saving taxpayers $500 million a year. I'm also proud of some of the other individuals who are standing with me. I've been on the front lines with janitors fighting for the fight for 15. People need to be paid a decent wage. Anyone working hard in this country should not be living in poverty, should be able to provide for themselves and their families. And you know what, women standing with me, um, I'm proud of that too, at a time when our own state legislature is poised to take action that would take away a woman's right to choose. These are values that are at stake, and these individuals are standing with me because they know I'm a champion, I'm a fighter, and I'll have the back of hardworking families in this country. Thank you. Mr. Sestak. When I kicked off my campaign a year ago, I held up the combat boots I'd worn on the ground in Afghanistan as head of the Navy's anti-terrorism unit. And I said, I'm going to walk 422 miles across this state because the biggest deficit we have in America today is the trust deficit. People don't trust, rightly, the leaders of either party. They understand that over 433 congressmen and senators have left Congress and taken lobbying jobs. That's why I turned down six and seven figure lobbying jobs and went to teach at our universities after I left Congress. They do the same thing in Harrisburg. I also kept my office open seven days a week up until 9 o'clock during that recession, handling 18,000 of my fellow countrymen and women four times any other congressional office. And as I did that walk, I said, I am not asking any, any politician or any organization for an endorsement. All I want is to walk in the shoes of Pennsylvanians and earn their trust. Because people in the political party, often in Washington, D.C., aren't in it for people any longer. They're in it for power and themselves. Mr. Sestak, thank you. Mr. Fetterman. Sure. Well, of course I would be an independent voice uh, if I was elected to Congress. I'm not beholden to any endorsements, any special interests. I'm simply beholden to the people that I've represented uh, in Braddock for the last 11 years and for people all across this great commonwealth. Uh, throughout my time in Braddock, I've simply sought to be a champion for a community that had been left by the side of the road and had been written off. 
and the lessons that I've learned and the successes that we've achieved in Braddock, I think have a lesson for a lot of communities, this entire roster of communities all across Pennsylvania that have been left behind in their better days or a generation ago. So, um, you know, I've, I owe no, nothing to anybody in this race except the people that would have elected me, and I'm beholden to no special interests, money, endorsements, or otherwise. Mr. Sestak, let's talk about national security for a moment. How confident are you that the president's nuclear deal with Iran and his handling of ISIS will keep us safe and, and is in our national interest? It is in our national interest as well as Israel's. But I'm tougher than Ronald Reagan who said, trust but verify. I say verify before you trust. But think about this. Iran was within 30 days of having four nuclear bombs. And we kicked it out of that country by bringing them to their knees with economic sanctions. And our military option is still there. Now 150 people can go in at a moment's notice and inspect. Is the military option there? Sure it is. But understand, I've operated in that Persian Gulf in a carrier battle group. We cannot find the 19 mini-submarines of the Iranians. Our sonar doesn't work there. So we'll pull our carrier battle groups out of the streets of Ramos, and then we'll begin the strike. And when we begin that strike, it will take weeks and months. It's why I did the study with about 20 other retired flag admirals and national security officials. Because we'll first have to knock down the hundreds of missiles that can rain down on our troops in Bahrain and Israel, as well as their air defenses. And then we have to go after their, uh, the facilities. One of them under 300 feet of rock. We'll stop them for four years. The issue is this. We kicked it out through diplomacy, tough diplomacy, and we're ready to back it up with our military. But now we've kicked their nuclear capability out. And people have to understand there's so few in Senate who does run across this nation or down in the Senate today in both parties that militaries, Terry, can stop a problem. We don't fix a problem. Does anybody think we fixed Iraq? And that's why we need some cautious heads down there that understand our, that if, before you take the first step in war, understand the last and how to secure the peace. And that's why I'm worried about Syria today. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fetterman. Sure. Uh, of course, we, we don't trust Iran. But at the end of the day, they are a major player in the Middle East, and it's wise to engage them. It's wise to reach out to them and, and enter into this treaty. The treaty is imperfect. Even its most ardent supporters acknowledge that. And the flip side is, is that I've been across this state now, going across since September, and I've yet to encounter a single person that has been happy with the way things have gone in the Middle East for the last 15 years. We've entered this horrible war of choice in Iraq that squandered trillions of dollars, almost 5,000 of our servicemen and women killed, not to mention hundreds of uh, thousands of Iraqis. We have not had a good experience uh, in the Middle East, and we need to learn that lesson. And I think the president has done just that. Diplomacy over wars of choice, and I believe Iraq, excuse me, that ISIS is a threat to the United States, but I don't believe it's an existential threat to the United States, and it should not be enough to bring us into another war of choice in the Middle East, given our history there the last 15 years. Ms. McGinn. Yeah, Terry, I uh, uh, agree that it was vital uh, to try our, our best to deprive Iran of nuclear capability. Uh, an Iran that continues to pose um, a threat every day to our ally Israel. Um, and one of the things that I think we need to step up and be more aggressive on uh, is the enforcement, for example, of, uh, of, of provisions in UN resolutions with respect to missiles. We have Iran still testing missiles uh, and threatening uh, Israel in that respect. But the, uh, the accomplishment of depriving Iran of an almost immediate nuclear capability that they were on the brink of securing uh, was an incredibly important one. With respect to ISIS, I do think it's vital uh, that we continue what we have seen working through airstrikes, uh, supporting not American troops on the ground, Sunni troops on the ground, Kurd troops on the ground, to pull back uh, that caliphate, to continue to seize back territory that has been a breeding ground uh, for terrorists we've seen strike in Europe and elsewhere. Okay. I have a follow-up on this. Mr. Sestak, on the troops in Syria, if I have this correct, you are not in favor of, of our American ground troops in Syria. Are you confident that the coalition is, that is there now can move aggressively enough to defeat ISIS before it spreads its additional war on terror throughout the, the universe? No, I'm not. 
But that doesn't involve U.S. troops having to go in. We have our air power there, but belatedly, you're finally knocking the legs out from the caliphate. That is destroying the crude oil uh, money that it gets, and also the money centers with hundreds of millions of dollars being destroyed. They get two to three billion dollars a year from that, and that's how they can do their damage worldwide. But what I feel we haven't done as well is tough diplomacy, where we ha should have worked immediately with Putin and the Iranians that have 3,000 of their soldiers on the ground. Their common enemy is ISIS, and we should have bandied them together with Saudi Arabia leading those 32 militias and had them do the ground game because we right. don't want a U.S. soldier to be leading that. We want a Sunni soldier to be good, leading good. that. You want to respond to that? You okay? Go ahead. Uh, well, well, no, the, uh, Syria is, is a complex uh, issue, and you have, it's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and, and Saudi Arabia is in, engaged, so engaging them would be difficult. At the end of the day, we as a country have to decide, does ISIS pose an existential threat to this country and its security, and is it worth getting, uh, you know, having this banana peel, if you will, into another misguided war of choice here in the Middle East? You know, I believe that as senator, I would uh, be uh, very, very hesitant to even consider that option unless something changes dramatically in the situation. Thank you. Go, go. Well, Terry, I think when we ran into Iraq, we had very little understanding of the complexities there. And a similar situation poses here in Iran and in Syria. Really at the heart of this, we're talking about a multi-century battle that is now a civil war and it's a sectarian war. Uh, and any easy notion that we'll just send troops in there and that'll fix it, um, that's never has worked and it wouldn't work here and it would embroil us again in wars that um, are not fixable uh, by easy intervention. It's time to make sure that our allies and Sunnis, Arabs, Kurds in the region take this issue on and take it on forcefully. Thank you, Jerry. Next question is for Mr. Fetterman. Let's talk about the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, debate around the country and here in Pennsylvania about raising the minimum wage. You have said you support raising the minimum wage. I do. What is the number that you support and why that number? Uh, sure. Small businesses say that it would hurt them. They say it would cause them to, to cut jobs. What's the right number and why? Sure. Well, uh, I, uh, I've always championed the idea of a $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, I was contacted by a union in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and they clean, uh, I met a worker that cleans hotel rooms. And uh, he makes seven seventy-five an hour and works 40 hours a week. And at the end of two weeks, worked 80 hours uh, in a job that we can all agree is, is difficult and backbreaking, has $357.93 to his name. And that to me is not a uh, wage. That is slavery with tipping. We all know that you can't live off that kind of money. We know that you can't live off $8 an hour, $9 an hour. And I believe $15 an hour is what we in this country deserve to pay workers. And I believe that's a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, if you're working full time in this country, you deserve to live a dignified manner. And a $15 an hour minimum wage uh, would go a long way to assuring that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McGinty. Thank you. Uh, you know, this country uh, it has always been built on a recognition that hard work should be the key, the ticket to getting ahead. And we've honored that. We've rewarded that with decent wages. People have come together. They've fought for decent wages. And I've been proud to be on the front lines calling for $15 an hour. I agree with John. You can't stop there, though. And we should get this out of the political arena and enable that minimum wage to increase with inflation. Uh, you know, every study shows that part of the reason that our climbing out of this recession has been so slow and difficult is specifically because wages have not kept pace. If we want to grow this economy, we have to pay people more. Seventy percent of all economic activity is consumer purchasing power. So if we want a shot in the arm for the economy, we need to start paying hardworking people more. Second thing is, I also think we should support families, family and medical uh, leave, <clears throat> paid leave, and child care. When you do that, you very significantly increase economic activity, half a trillion dollars or more of new activity we could generate. Thank you. Mr. Sesta. Jerry, we have to do it. Uh, when I went to Congress, one of my first votes was to raise it about 40 percent, up to $7.25 in a three-step process. 
Studies have demonstrated that if you raise the minimum wage to no more than half the average hourly wage, which is $10.80 today, no jobs are lost. In fact, New Jersey raised it up to that level a few years ago. Pennsylvania didn't, and no jobs were lost. And then you index it to inflation. And the reason is to graze it up as wages keep increasing up to that $15 and beyond level. The reason this is so important is about two-thirds of those on minimum wage are women. About two-thirds of them are working moms, often the principal breadwinners bringing it back. And so when the minimum wage today is only about 60% of what it was in the 60s, what are we doing? Particularly when you go into a place like Walmart, has about 300 employees, we are paying their wages because they can qualify for food stamps and Medicaid. Unconscionable. I would actually like to follow up on this, yeah. Mr. Fairman, because the second part of my question I mentioned about small businesses, I personally know people who work for a lower wage, below $10 an hour, admittedly at a nonprofit, a lot of people work there for $8 or $9 an hour. Mm -hmm. If that company <clears throat> in particular would have to pay $15 an hour, they may go under. I mean, that's a major difference. I mean, what's your response for the business owner that says, look, this will completely change going from I'm paying my, my employees $8 or $9 an hour to 15 It's a big jump. It is a big jump. But at the end of the day, if it's, uh, if it's a law and it goes into full effect, it's applicable for everybody. And it's, we as a society have adjusted throughout the ages uh, to new and bold proposals. It was once considered revolutionary that children wouldn't work in factories or in the field and that they would actually go to school, uh, that women could join and enter the workforce. And we've absorbed that beautifully. So this idea that it, I believe it's a false choice, everybody deserves who works full time to live a dignified existence. Ms. McGinty, what would you yeah, say to small businesses? Jerry, listen, I think what we have seen in the states that have been ahead of the curve um, in already raising the minimum wage, just about every one of those states has outcompeted uh, neighboring states in terms of job creation and in terms of economic growth, including and specifically in those industries that might have been first and foremost in um, absorbing that increase in the minimum wage. And you know, if you step back for a second, you think about it, uh, you can understand that there are good reasons as to why some of the costs might get offset. For example, uh, if you are not having to uh, continuously retrain workers because you're losing workers because they weren't making a decent enough wage, that's a dramatic reduction in costs that, up, that offsets the increase in wage. And then, you know, you have customer satisfaction that improves and quality of service that improves along those lines as well. Thank you. Mr. Sessler. Jerry, that's why I said analytical studies have demonstrated if you raise it up to only two half of the average hourly wage, with a case study I demonstrated of Jersey and us, jobs aren't lost because it costs more to retrain someone if you below that wage. I was vice chairman of the Small Business Committee. About 500,000 small businesses didn't survive last year as we create about 600,000. There's a lot of reasons why they fail, but here's the real issue for them. We are creating only half as many small businesses as we used to per working American in the 70s. The problem is twofold. It costs 40% more for regulation for small businesses than for a big Walmart because they can't marginalize the cost of the regulation. And there's ways to fix that. And second, to start up those small businesses again to get them on the playing field for the full time, not just 18 per 10,000 working minutes, but 36. They need access to capital to start up. Wisconsin did it with a tax credit for investors. They quadrupled the investment in small businesses and started them going. That's what they need. Mr. Sesnick, thank you. All right, Ms. McGinty, uh, we're going to talk about health care. There's probably no more complicated subject mm. than we could define this evening than health care. In Pennsylvania, let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. In Pennsylvania, the average cost of premiums rose about 11 percent. If you bought the cheapest plan, the cost went up about 15 percent. And now some major providers are stepping back from even offering coverage. So should we reform the Affordable Care Act, or as some have said, should we go to a single payer? How do you deal with the cost that it w would be uh, largely borne by businesses and others in the community? Should we go to the AC, should we go to the single payer system or reform the uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act? Well, we absolutely have to take on the cost of health care. Uh, look, I think that the Affordable Care Act has brought us important gains, uh, gains like not um, 
disqualifying someone from insurance because they have a pre-existing pre condition, for example, or the gains that I was proud to, to help deliver here in Pennsylvania with the expansion of Medicaid that both covered 500,000 people and cut uh, the bill to the taxpayers by $500 million a year. That's good stuff. But costs are out of control and need to be brought under control. How can we do that? One, we're the only uh, uh, country in the world that does not have our health service negotiate with big pharma to bring down the costs of prescription drugs. There's a study I just saw again the other day showing prices as high as 200 times for some drugs here in the United States as compared to the very same drugs available in other countries. Let's, let's take the handcuffs off there and allow that negotiation to happen to bring the cost down. We took an initiative here in the state as well in terms of home and community-based health care. That is an option that many seniors in particular would like to have, and it's a tenth of the cost for service. Uh, the big picture here, though, is whether it's with the insurance companies and taking a look at um, big advertising budgets and excessive overhead, those costs can and should be brought down and especially with respect to big pharma and the cost of phar uh, pharmaceuticals, we can bring those costs down, and we have to, because the costs are really getting away from individuals and families. Mr. Sestak. Mr. Chair, as you know, this issue is personal to me. I retired from the Navy to take care of my daughter at four years old. She had brain cancer, and she's 14 today, going on 22. <laughs> I have got into Congress in the Republican District to run for health care for all. I was an advocate and a fighter for Affordable Care Act, but Terry, you got to look at the facts. The facts are here in Pennsylvania, the premiums are actually on the gold, the bronze, and the silver of the Affordable Care Act right. less than the employer-based provision. Not only that, but insurance companies are jumping in. 25% more insurance companies got in this year than last year. They're not leading. That one company you mentioned, I think it was United, United Care. Care right. Well, the director of the Affordable Care Act said they just misjudged how to price it out there. And so we have cut with this where it, overall uh, cost of health care from used to be 6% a year, now it is 3%. It's a perfect heck, heck no. To your point, Jerry, Small businesses, for some reason, not in the House, but in the Senate, they made that inane rule that if you hire a 50th employee, you've got to provide health care. We had it as a percentage of payroll. We've got to fix the Affordable Care Act, continue to bring down costs by advancing the affordable care organizations within them where you're rewarded, not for how many times someone comes in, but for the quality of care that the person doesn't have to come in. And that's what we have to continue to do to advance home security for everyone. Mr. Federman. It, it's one of the great questions of, of our era. Is health care a right or is health care a privilege that should be afforded to the few? Um, and I fundamentally believe, and my campaign fundamentally believes, that health care is a right. And because it, it's a right, it's something that should be extended to everybody. And the Affordable Care Act has done a magnificent job in extending that insurance coverage. We now enjoy 90% coverage in this country. Um, and things like Republicans have pre-existing conditions. Democrats have pre-existing conditions. I don't know why that could have ever been considered controversial. Republicans have children now that can stay on their parents' policies until they turn 27, and so do Democrats. Um, there are so many aspects of this that should have never been controversial uh, in, in the first place. Uh, we are the only industrialized country uh, that doesn't provide universal health care for all its residents. That would be the ideal. The Affordable Care Act has been an excellent first step, and the perfectibility of that trans ca contrasted to universal care is an issue that we'll have to work out uh, in the following years. All right, Mr. Fenneman, thank you very much. We are about halfway through tonight's debate right now, so we're going to take a quick two-minute break, but we'll be right back with much more from the Pennsylvania Democratic U.S. Senate debate right after this. Are you a current PCN Select subscriber? Download the new PCN Select app today from any online app store. Now you can watch video on demand, access special live event streams, watch the live network, or visit the PCN store without leaving the app. The new PCN Select app is a fast, easy way to access the programs you love anytime, anywhere. Download the new PCN Select app today. PCN is your go-to source for everything Pennsylvania. Join us on April 26th for live coverage of the Pennsylvania primary election. 
We'll have in-depth coverage from candidates' headquarters and studio guests to provide result analysis. Watch on cable or through your PCN Select app with exclusive streams from campaign headquarters. When the polls close, PCN is the place to be. Live coverage begins Tuesday, April 26th at 8.30 p.m. Welcome back to WGAL's Commitment 2016 election coverage, the debate between the three people running for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senate. And let's get right to our next question, and it is for you, Mr. Sestak. Non-discrimination bills in several states have gotten a lot of attention recently. Do you support legislation to allow a person to use a bathroom that matches their gender identity as opposed to their assigned gender? I think that transgenders should be able to use the bathroom that they believe they should go to. My gosh. I went to war with those who in the LGBT community, even though it was don't ask, don't tell at the time, they were there fighting for our nation. Now we knew who they were, they just couldn't tell and we just couldn't admit it. We came home. How can they not have equal rights? I just went down to the Navy Yard with a rabbi who was in the Navy with me. I spoke at his invocation in Montgomery County and he asked me to go back down there now that he can be out as a proud. LGBT member, to be down there to celebrate on Pride Day where the military said LGBT. So yes, they should be able to use it based upon where they believe they should go into it. Look, this is a serious issue because if you go downtown Philadelphia and look at the homeless children, it's about 40% higher on the LGBT community for our youth there because sometimes they're pushed out of the homes, they're not accepted. They go down there and so many more become involved in drugs and, and, and other issues in order to just make a go of it. So it is the entire LGBT community. Look, everyone is created equal, whether you're an L, G, B, or T, and you should be able to be out there to go to where you want to go to take care of what you want to do in eating or public accommodations of any sort, including public accommodations of toilets, etc. I strongly believe that. And you go around this world and you see how other countries don't treat their people. We are a beacon of equality and that's for everyone. That's just like, thank you. Mr. Federman. Sure. Uh, of the three, three candidates here, I believe I have the strongest record of support for the LGBT community. And to answer the question, absolutely they should be able to use the bathroom that they identify with their, their gender identity. Uh, back in 2013, I officiated, I was the first state official to officiate a same-sex wedding uh, here in Pennsylvania when it was illegal. Then Governor Corbett uh, threatened that there would be legal sanctions, there'd be penalties, uh, there'd be a price to pay at the polls, and, and uh, fortunately it didn't work out that way. And I did this because it was the right thing to do, and because we as America deserve better uh, for our LGBT community. I do the right thing. Uh, when I see a need like that. And I'm proud to say that. And at the end of the day, we in this country must embrace full gender and uh, uh, LGBT equality in this country. Thank you. Ms. McGinty. Now, Jerry, I think we're at a critically important juncture in our country's uh, history and story. In the Republican presidential debates uh, we have with Donald Trump, incredibly divisive, discriminatory language that is so contrary to what the history and strength of our country has been. Diversity has been and is our strength. Uh, but there are those who would tear us apart. 
And I think especially now it's critically important to stand up and to embrace the dignity of every single human being. So yes, I do support full access uh, for the LGBT community to the bathroom that the individual identifies with. Uh, I think most people on the street today, if you stop them and you said, true or false, is it legal in Pennsylvania today to fire somebody just because of their sexual identity? Most people would say, well, that can't be true in this day and age. And yet it is. We have to pass non-discrimination legislation. Uh, and we certainly have to stop this legislation that is bigotry in thin, thin disguise and make sure that we are standing for the dignity of every single American. Thank you. Mr. Fetterman, uh, you live in one of the areas of the state known historically and even now as an energy center in a state. Pennsylvania is one of the leading producers of energy. In the last decade or so, the development of natural gas by fracking has emerged as a significant issue. You have called for a moratorium on fracking. Mm -hmm. What do you want to know before you would agree to have that moratorium lifted? Sure. Excellent. Um, yeah, I called for a moratorium on fracking because I just fundamentally believe that there are two important conditions that need to be met before uh, we would resume fracking. Pennsylvania, as some people may or may not know, is the only state in the country that does not have an extraction tax uh, paid. Uh, and I think that needs to change, particularly in a state that's as revenue starved as, as ours is, and that money could be dedicated and should be dedicated to supporting public education. Two, if we really are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, as many have uh, described us, we should have the most stringent, uh, uh, really the finest environmental regulations uh, in the country. And I don't see that, and I think we need that. We owe the future generations that we're not creating uh, tens of thousands of future love canals here in the state. So those are the two conditions that I would insist upon uh, seeing before uh, I would want to resume fracking in the state. Ms. McGinty. Well, uh, Terry, in terms of uh, this whole issue of energy and the environment, it is one that I have dedicated my entire career to. Uh, when I was Secretary of Environmental Protection here in Pennsylvania, uh, we went from nowhere uh, on renewable energy to one of the very leaders in the country. Uh, by the end of my tenure, we were uh, among the leaders in wind energy jobs and third in the country in solar energy uh, jobs. Uh, with respect to, respect to any industrial activity, fracking included, we have to have a tough environmental cop on the beat regulate it, zone it, tax it. I was proud when I was working with Governor Wolf that we imposed a ban on fracking um, in our state parks and forests. We immediately took one of the biggest enforcement actions ever against the fracking industry and really cracked down on air, water to ensure that we've got the toughest regulations in place. Uh, I'm proud to have the League of Conservation Voters, Environmental Defense Action Fund, others who have recognized me as a champion of the environment taking on these issues, and they're critically important. Absolutely need a tough environmental cop on the beat. Last, I'll just say, I'm sick of seeing the Oklahoma and Texas license plates. If this is our energy, it should be our jobs. Mr. Sestak. We know, I was for a moratorium in 2010 when I ran, and I'm here for one still today. Because in the military, you learn to expect what you inspect. And when we began fracking here, the EPA was forbidden by a law passed in about 2005 from coming into our Commonwealth and going to see whether the lead that they used in fracking was getting into our drinking water. We don't want another flint. Look, as we say, piss poor planning gives piss poor results. And so get it right. As the Auditor General said, we weren't ready when we began fracking. DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, when it began it, didn't have the manpower, the regulations, the oversight to do it. So that's why Range Resources reported 47 violations done in 2011, 12, 13, 14, all supposed to be cleaned up in 90 days. I just want to get it right so that we don't have like happened in anthracite mining after it was done, $13 billion of ruined water. And in particular, we have, they have to remember it was the Navy that developed the sonar for them at millions of dollars for them to be able to even frack. And we developed the diamond bit drill. What do you mean we can't have a return of our investment with an excise tax? 
Mr. Fagner, you want to? Another troubling aspect uh, of the fracking industry here in Pennsylvania is the, the so-called Halliburton rule. And that rule was inserted into the legislation that forbid the identification of the chemicals that uh, that comprise the, the, the fracking fluid. And that's a clear violation of the Clean Water Act. Um, and that is just Washington at its worst. The fact that, that uh, they inserted a law to make it illegal to disclose that, to know what's going into potentially our drinking water, uh, you know, that's another thing that absolutely needs to change with respects to, yeah. to fracking in the, in the state. Anybody else? I have a follow up. Anybody else want to respond to that? Well, I think that the Halliburton loophole actually even goes further and exempts compliance with Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act. You know, if you've got nothing to hide, you should be willing to comply with the law. As a United States Senator, I would definitely go after closing that loophole. But you know, in the law here in Pennsylvania too, uh, we need to take out something that's called the gag order that's there that doesn't allow physicians who might be concerned about health impacts. Uh, to speak with other s physicians. Look, we need to have that environmental cop on the beat. We need to be protecting public health and the environment. And the public needs to have a seat mm -hmm. at the table to be involved <clears throat> in decisions about this industry. Yeah, yeah um, to the points my uh, running mates made, uh, I co-sponsored the FRAC Act down there to try to call what John rightly calls uh, the Halliburton loophole, which was what I said the EPA under the Safe Water Drinking Act is forbidden by a waiver that the fracking industry got done not to inspect. But second is, to all point well made, a million dollars put into natural gas gives you one job. Because you drill it, you move on. A million dollars, as we talk about alternatives, put into a wind turbine with 400 tons of metal gives you five jobs. Solar power gives you about six. That's why we have to go there, because that really is where the job creation, permanent job creation, comes from. So I my follow-up, which I didn't get to ask because Mr. Fetterman jumped in, which is perfectly fine. Look, right now, the price of natural gas is really, really depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> severance tax, though it's popular in virtually every poll, would bring in nowhere near what it would have two or three years ago. So is the future to end fracking, the, uh, fracking altogether? I mean, is that the goal, to get rid of it altogether? Or... Is there somehow some way that an accommodation can be made with that aspect of the energy? I'll give you each a few. Go ahead. Well, we'll, we'll I, go down. All, uh, I'm sorry, who's going? No, no, you go. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Federer. With all due respect, uh, Mr. Madan, I, I feel like that's sort of a false choice. Uh, energy prices fluctuate. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, in fact, in the 2012 presidential election, uh, Newt Gingrich was calling President Obama the $10 a gallon gas president. Mm -hmm. And now gas, you can actually get less than $2 an hour. Natural gas price is low now. That could change uh, and probably will change uh, in the next six months to a year. So in this idea that these companies, if, if you know, we all three go out and celebrate our, our debate here and go buy a pizza, we're going to pay tax on that. And, you know, middle class families pay tax on all the things that they pur uh, purchase. So I think it's only fair that if they're going to extract our natural resource, that they also pay a tax. Well, Tyler, uh, unlike some of the conversation we had before, it's small business. This is Exxon Mobil we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so <clears throat> even the, uh, the severance tax that has been debated here in Pennsylvania does not represent a very significant fraction of the kind of profits and profitability that a company like ExxonMobil has. But in terms of the boom and bust that I think you're pointing to, that's why we absolutely have to insist that we're not just going to be the equivalent of a third world country, take our resources and it all gets exported. We need to have the value added good jobs created in this Commonwealth and we can be on the cutting edge of advanced clean high tech manufacturing. But only if we step up and say we're going to train Pennsylvanians to have those high paying jobs and we're not going to just export a raw resource, we're going to convert it into high quality, high value added products. Mm -hmm. If there was ever a time to do it, it's now. And here's why. That the pipes to take out natural gas from Pennsylvania are completely filled. They can't pump anymore out. In fact, there's been 70 wells that have been drilled they're not even fracking them because they can't push any more out. Of the 67 rigs that go around our Commonwealth to drill, only about 19 are even doing anything. So right now is the moment to do it. But also notice, Terry, of the other 14 states that actually have an excise tax, and we're the only one of the 15 with natural gas that doesn't, they haven't taken away their excise tax. So now's the moment to get our return on the investment of the Navy 
millions of dollars investing in them to do it that they couldn't have fracking without or the diamond bit drill to say let's a return to our investment because range resources you didn't clean up the mess you were supposed to and let's get our regulations right and then we can see if we can proceed yeah but we do have an impact fee which the uh oil the natural gas companies pay that doesn't exist in other but it's not ahead. equivalent at all to what okay. you can get with a five percent excise tax and as you know that was kind of a small little push over kind of thing and we can still give impact fees but five percent that's a big difference in what's okay. the impact fees. We'll let each one of you jump in if you want to go well, ahead. Well it, 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 it is true every objective analysis that has been done of the impact fee shows that it is not even a fraction of what every other state uh, imposes by way of a severance Seven. tax and make no mistake we pay the severance tax here because these markets are regional and national. And so when Alaska enjoys a severance tax, it's Pennsylvanians paying for it and it's going into the pocket of Alaskans. You know, it's not right. Pennsylvanians deserve to have their resources justly paid for. And you know, when we see the crisis we have in our budget and schools suffering for resources, it is absolutely not right to jack up people's property taxes while we let ExxonMobil walk away without paying a severance tax. Are you okay? You want to yeah, well, ahead. I mean, Go there's ahead. a reason Comment. why they spend tens of millions of dollars for lobbying uh, over the last several years. It, and it, I doubt it's because they enjoy the company of our lawmakers so much at lunch. Um, <laughs> I got one of the offers. <laughs> turn it down. <laughs> uh, so so th they're obviously out for something. They actually expect something in exchange. And, and of course, they don't want to pay uh, a severance tax. So, and I think, as my colleagues have pointed out, uh, that's to the to the detriment of Pennsylvania, and I think it's unfair, and it's something that we need to bring in line with every other state in the United States where fracking is uh, occurring. Thank, Thank you very man. much. Next question is from Ms. McGinty. Who a person supports in a presidential campaign says a lot about them, their views, and their politics. Obviously, all three of you are Democrats, but in the Democratic primary, there's a very heated campaign going on right now between former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Senator Bernie Sanders. Ms. McGinty, who do you support in the presidential campaign and why? Well, first of all, I have to say I am proud of both of our Democratic front runners. Um, and as compared to what we've seen on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, the discussion, the debate has been about ideas. It's been about issues and values. Uh, I have supported and endorsed Hillary Clinton because I had the honor of working with her when I was in the White House with President Clinton. Uh, and I was driving forward initiatives like environmental justice and the impact on children uh, various kinds of environmental pollution uh, and she was always supportive and helpful uh, along those lines. But the issues that the Democrats are raising, this um, historic um, loss of value and economic standing of working families and the middle class is the vital issue uh, of our country right now. You know, I have sat down with uh, hardworking women and men working two, working three jobs, uh, but they can barely uh, pay the bills and most of them feel themselves falling further and further behind. I've sat down with families struggling in terms of college tuition debts. Now not just the student, but the parents who have taken out the Parents PLUS loans and the grandparents struggling then to help out as well. You know, we have in Senator Pat Toomey, somebody who has voted against raising people's wages, somebody who has voted against middle class tax cuts to support and afford college, has voted against enabling people to refinance uh, their, their student loans, and is voting to take away people's social security. Look, the Democratic front runners are, gonna, are fighting for hardworking families, and I'm really proud of the kind of dialogue issues, ideas they're putting on the table. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Sestak, as I lose my paper, <laughs> uh, who do you support? Uh, as I president? mentioned earlier, uh, when you asked about endorsements, I've neither asked for nor have I given an endorsement. Because frankly, when I ran against Senator Specter and the whole world endorsed him, I found it didn't really matter because people weren't trusting anymore. 42% of the families in the largest city in Pennsylvania live in poverty. They're not asking who I endorse or who someone else endorsed. They want to know what I would do. But I do respect the two candidates who are running. Having worked in the White House closely with Secretary Clinton, uh, Clinton, she helped me get Agent Orange more covered for our vets, actually. As even First Lady, I think she would be a very fine Commander-in-Chief. Bernie Sanders, I thank for raising the scourge of our society, income inequality, 
But if you only fix that and look at it that way, then that means redistribution of wealth and some benefits. That's taking care of the fever, not the source of it. I believe in economic mobility. That's why I did those events all the way across Pennsylvania as I walked. Small businesses we talked about, get them going again, relieve the regulation to get demand for labor. Education, our homeland defense, let's get it. And fair pay for women, which isn't happening. And the biggest source of discrimination we have today, pregnancy discrimination. So that's what gives us economic mobility. But endorsements? Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Fetterman, do yeah. you support the presidential race? I'm proud to say that I'm the only candidate in this race that has uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders for president. And I chose Bernie Sanders for, uh, to endorse uh, for the very same reason that I was the only elected official in western Pennsylvania to endorse Barack Obama in 2008 uh, when he was running for president. Because I believed then that Senator Obama was the right candidate for the job and he's where the party is going. And in 2016, I believe Bernie Sanders is where the party is and where the party is going. And to most respectfully disagree with my colleague, Mr. Sestak, um, inequality um, is more than just one issue. It is the signature issue of our day. And if anyone thinks that inequality is just one issue, I don't believe that they fully understand the scourge of, of inequality because it pervades everything. Education, health care, housing, health, you, you name it. Um, it's not just one issue, and I, that's why I am proud to say that I've endorsed Bernie Sanders for president. He wants to follow up. And Mr. Sestak, you were With mentioned by someone, name there. Go ahead and respond. I do respect. He actually said what I said. Income inequality is a scourge, but if you look at it only as redistribution of wealth, as only more benefits, you don't fix it permanently. Much, John, like you said, and I said, small businesses got to be heavy, education's got to be done. So I think we're on the same sheet of music here. I'm probably a little more off tune. But, <laughs> but that is where what we have to do is economic mobility, give them a fair opportunity to be all they might be. We're going to stay with you, Mr. Sestak. Uh, I, I think, without doubt, one of the more, more important roles for United States senators is to advise and consent on judicial nominations, federal judicial nominations. Before the Senate now is President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. Coming up in the next six years, the, obviously the term for the new senator from this state, you would have what? a possibility of two or three additional nominations to the court. And so here's my question. Would you have a litmus test to your vote to consent to a presidential nominee? If so, what would, that, what would the ingredients involve? First off, it's egregious how Pat Toomey and everyone else won't even let the constitutional duty of the president and themselves be conducted to have them come forward for a vote. That said, I also believe that the second most important vote a senator makes, besides the decision to go to war, is who is going to, they're going to vote for for the Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, shapes the character of America probably more than any other branch. Roe versus Wade, Brown versus Board of Education, Gore versus Bush, a presidential election, Affordable Care Act goes there. And so therefore, I want to make sure that that nominee who comes before him understands the two great tenets that sit under our soul rugged individualism, let those pe individuals be all they can be, but we're all in this together with the Affordable Care Act, for example. So as I look at a nominee coming forward, I want to make sure that they do understand the issue that you raised, sir, Jerry, that LGBT, the entire community, is, equal, is, is equal to everyone else. I want to make sure the issue I raised up, that government does have a role to play for the people of paycheck fairness. I want to make sure that choice is well defended for our women that it is their choice. And going through those, those are not litmus test by issues. What they are is understanding that we do want a government that doesn't unduly interfere with our freedom, but one that is joined together in the commonwealth, the common good, where the government of the people can actually come together on it. And those three examples are some of the ones that I would insist that we would have somebody on the Supreme Court to best defend the character of America. Okay, Ms. McGinty. Well, uh, Terry, I mean, I think this whole episode just shows uh, how privileged a class um, Washington has become, so out of touch with the reality of hardworking people. You know, I know my own dear dad, who walked the beat for 35 years as a policeman, or my mother who went to work uh, every night as a hostess in a restaurant, if either of them would have just refused to do their job for what's going to amount to a year, they would have been out of that job. There are not a whole lot of things that the Constitution lays out that senators have to do. Mm -hmm. This is one. It's clear. 
senators need to advise and consent when the president makes a nomination. You know, Senator Toomey needs to do his job or, frankly, um, step aside. And this is vital. Every issue that is before the Supreme Court is one that uh, vastly and extensively impacts Americans in every aspect of their life. Thank you. Mr. Fetterman. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm actually proud to say that I do have several litmus tests. Um, and really, those litmus tests really comprise what I believe are the core, some of the core bedrock principles uh, that we as Democrats embrace. First of which, um, do you uh, support uh, the repeal of Citizens United? I believe money in politics is a cancer. Citizens United uh, needs to be repealed. Two, to protect a woman's right to choose. Uh, that right was enshrined by the Supreme Court, but is now under siege in many states across this country, particularly states like Texas. Uh, that would be another thing that I would absolutely insist upon. Three, do you believe in the general consensus, the scientific consensus of climate change? We can't have somebody on the Supreme Court that just trusts their gut because it snowed last week that we don't have an issue with climate. Four, do you support uh, the equal rights for uh, the LGBT and transgendered community? We have to enumerate their rights and include those in the basic civil right legislation. And finally, a union's right to organize. And those are my five litmus tests, if you will, for anyone that I would vote for uh, for Supreme Court. Thank you very much. All right. We are just about done here, so we are going to have closing statements. And in fact, due to the time, each of you will have 30 <laughs> seconds for your closing statements. We want to make sure everybody gets in, and we'll start with you, Mr. Sestak. There is one endorsement I would like to have, and that's of the people. I served this nation in the Navy. I served it as a congressman after my daughter got brain cancer, universal health care for all, keeping us all, our office open seven days a week. And then I turned down those lobbying jobs and went to teach. I want to bring integrity of service back to public officials. I don't want to just win. I would like to govern. And you can't do it without the trust of the people. More than anything else, that's why I'm running. I very much want to make sure we restore the American dream in housing and education, but you can't do it without the trust of people. I ask for your endorsement. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. McGinty. Thank you. We're at a critical point in our country's history and in the experience of every family in this commonwealth and country. If you're working hard out there, your paycheck should show it. You have earned Social Security. It needs to be there for you in your retirement. Our families need affordable health care. These are some of the basics. You know, America has always celebrated hard work. I come from a hardworking family. There's nothing I value more than investing in young people and standing by our families. I'm Katie McGinty, and I'm asking for your support because it's time, it's your turn for the middle class to get ahead. Thank you very much. Mr. Federman. Most important order of business, I want to wish my mother a happy 67th birthday. She's <laughs> out there watching. Two, I'm here to ask for your support. I've been the mayor of a community in western Pennsylvania that was really left for dead. And for the last 11 years, we've been building that community back up. And I fundamentally believe that the successes and the lessons that we've learned in that fight are applicable all across Pennsylvania for all of Pennsylvania's communities. And I'm running for the United States Senate to be a champion for these communities all across Pennsylvania the way I've been a champion for Braddock. And I'm honored to be honored to have your support. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Great debate tonight. In fact, we've used every last second. That does it for us. Thank you so much for watching it. Dr. Madonna, thank you.